Thank you, worship team. And we want to thank you. You have made Linda and myself just feel so welcome while we've been here. Uh, again, you're just so gracious, so friendly. Do you know what Afreda means? That's my understanding, fruitful. Every time I've come to Afreda, and I've come to Afreda for years, I've always thought Afreda was a neat place. I was born in Iowa. My dad wanted to be a farmer, but his dad insisted, uh, he said, I'll set you up in farming under one condition, you go to college first. My dad didn't want to go to college, he wanted to be a farmer. But he went to college, a small college back in Iowa. And uh, of all things, he decided to take physics. And he ended up being an engineer at NASA for 51 years. At first it was NACA, but then it changed to NASA. My brother is an engineer at NASA. My niece was an engineer at NASA. My brother-in-law is an engineer at NASA. And I was going to work at NASA, but God had other plans. But my daddy, even though he's an engineer at NASA, he always deep down wanted to still be a farmer. And if you're from Iowa, you know what they got back there is they got corn, soybeans, and hogs. And so every time I drive to Afreda, I see all the cornfields, and I think of my dad. Said, Boy, he'd love seeing this, because this is a fruitful place. This is a neat place. It's a clean place. Afreda is a clean city. You, you may know parts that aren't, but it sure looks clean to me. And, and I've always liked it. You guys actually have better shopping here than we have in Ellensburg. Afreda is a neat place. And God, I just pray for Afraid Ed. I pray for this church, even as the name means fruitful, that you have great, even more fruit, fruitfulness for this city, for this area, for this church, for these people. I ask your anointing upon me today because they don't need a sermon. They need something from you. And Jesus, no matter how much I study, I can't communicate that unless you anoint your word. Amen? Well, today we're going to be talking about the prevailing power of persistent prayer. For a lot of people, prayer is kind of a mystery. Why did God come up with that anyway? I mean, isn't what's going to happen going to happen? And God's Word and Jesus makes that abundantly clear. You see in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, the very last discourse he has before he really is betrayed and goes to the cross, six times he tells his people to pray. And in Luke, one of his last teachings, he does a parable about praying. We're going to be in Luke 18, but if you got your Bibles, would you turn to Revelation chapter 5, 9, and 10 ahead of time? We've been talking about how Jesus came as the promised king. He came to make all things right. He came to bring the rule, the reign, the kingdom of God. That's why he came. But what does that have to do with prayer? Revelation 5, 9, and 10 says this. It says the... 24 elders, the four living creatures, sang a song, and they're singing it to Jesus who is on the throne. It says, You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain. And you've redeemed us to God, you purchased us for God, is what it's saying, by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and it says, and you, you did this, you died on the cross, not just to pay for our sins. How many thank God he paid for our sins? But not just for that, he died on that cross to restore us to the place that God originally intended for people to occupy. And it says right here in verse 10, you've made us, his people, to be kings and and priests to our God. We're to serve him as kings and priests, and we're to reign on the earth. 
Back in those days, they had two types of kings. They had vassal kings. Those were the big kings. They were the emperor over an empire. It's like the Roman Empire. They had the emperor. He would have been the vassal king. But he delegated, he appointed kings under him. Herod was an example. The emperor in Rome would say, Herod, I appoint you as king over this area of Judea, and you're to rule over it for me. You're to exercise rule and authority for me. Jesus is king of kings. Amen? That's what the Bible says. But he is the vassal king. He's the ruler king over everything. But he raised us up to be what they call suzerain kings. Kings under him that he appoints. That's what we see right here in Revelation 5, 9, and 10. And that's a reason that when Jesus said to Peter, he says, Who do you say that I am? He said, You're the Christ, which is Bible talk for, You're the promised king. And he says, yeah, you're right, and I'm building my church. The gates of hell can't stop it. And I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. I'm giving you keys to rule as vassal, excuse me, as suzerain kings. Whatever you bind, that means whatever you forbid, whatever you say no to, he says, I'm agreeing with that. You've got to pray according to my will, but I'm agreeing that when you say no, there's a heavenly no behind that. And whatever you loose, whatever you set free, that word also means, that word loose means to destroy. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That's luo in Greek. That's the same word to loose. He said, I'm going to give you authority in your prayers to destroy the rule of the enemy. Another place, just one more place, Matthew 6, 9, to remember... Jesus says, here's how you pray. First, would your name be hallowed? Second, would your, kingdom, would, your, would your kingdom come? Would your will be done? He gave us authority as suzerain kings to pray for his rule, his will to be done in different situations. In Ephesians 1, if I'm talking too much, I'm sorry, just the way God wired me, okay? But in Ephesians 1, Paul prayed a prayer. He prayed for the church in Ephesus, and I'm going to pray this prayer for you. He prayed, he said, I pray that God would grant you, and Father, I pray for the church here in Ephrata, that your Holy Spirit would come upon them. You would grant them the spirit of wisdom and revelation that they would know you better. I pray that they would know the hope of their calling. We think that our hope of our calling above all is going to go to heaven when we die. We are going to live with him forever. But what he's talking about when you read Ephesians 1, 2, 3, all the way to chapter 6, the hope of our calling is to serve him and to reign on earth as his suzerain kings. He said, you need to know the hope you're calling. Everyone here, I don't care how young you are. I don't care how old you are, God want, he has a calling upon your life to make an impact in this world. You might be saying, who, me? Yes, you. It goes on to say that you might know the riches of his inheritance in the saints. Not our inheritance in him, but his inheritance is us as we serve him as kings. As we draw near to him, as we listen to him, as we obey him, as we trust him, as we pray his will is done. His kingdom is expanded. His inheritance grows. And he said this third, third thing. He, says, I, he said, you need to everyone here, and I pray this, God, that everyone here would know the exceeding greatness of your power, power toward them. It's flowing from your throne toward them, through them, even right now. Your word says it's in accordance with the working of your strength which you exerted when you raised your son Christ Jesus from the dead, far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, above every name that be can, can be named. You put Jesus as head over all things for the church. You put all things under his feet 
that the church, that the people here in Ephrata would be the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Jesus came as king to make all things right, but he wants to do it through us. That's the reason that he gave us prayer. Now, the main point that we're going to turn to Luke chapter 18, verse 1. I'm going there right now on my iPad. This is a really cool story that Jesus gives to illustrate a point. Most parables that Jesus gives, he lets it up to the people to figure out what he's saying. This one, he, it's so important, he tells you from the very beginning, this is the point I'm making. It says right here, and uh, I have no idea why I'm doing it out of the New American Standard, but that's what my notes are in, so I'm going to do it right here. Now, he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and to not lose heart, or they're not to give up. So that's your outline. This, this parable teaches us that according to his will, according to his pattern, and how we'll serve him as these suzerain kings, as his servants, we need to learn how to pray and not give up. He goes on to say here in verse 2, Now there was a, in a certain city there was a judge who didn't fear God and didn't respect man. I have some notes here for you. I'll just do a briefer version by telling you. As it says this judge did not fear God, he didn't care about people, he probably was not a Jewish judge. Back then, the city elders were the ones who would do the judgment, not one person. Since one person is doing this, this was someone who either Pontius Pilate appointed or King Herod appointed. There's a good chance this person, there, everyone was in for bribes. There's a good chance this person paid a bribe to get this position as a judge so he could take bribes from people and make decisions for them. That's the kind of judge he was. But it says right here in verse 3, there was a widow in that city, and it says she kept coming to him. Well, we'll talk about that just in a few minutes here. Orphans and widows especially were viewed as the weak of the weak. And when they're talking about a true widow, you'll see Paul referring to Who's to be put on the rolls of the church to support? He says, the, the true widow. A true widow, according to Jewish standards, was not someone simply whose husband had died. This is a person whose husband had died, but they had no children, and they had no other families who would take care of them. We see right here in letter C under point three, that at that time, Widows, women, could not inherit from their husband. It went back to his family. His family was to provide for the widow. But oftentimes they didn't. They didn't want him to marry her in the first place. Or why help her out? We could use this money ourselves. So any Jew at this time hearing the story from Jesus would assume here is a widow who has no family, and the husband's side of the family refuses to take care of her. She's off on her own. She has no one. When you read through Luke, Luke makes a very special point to highlight women. Women were the heroes of his stories. He's making a point of one, some pretty good examples of some pretty smart women, but also he's trying to do something there to kind of change the view of women. So quite often he makes women the hero of the stories that he incorporates in his gospel. We have right here in verse 3, continue on verse 3, as we said, she kept coming to him saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. Now this widow knew something. She was smart. She was sharp. And she was bold. She was a hero. And that's the way we need to be. We need to be smart. We need to be bold. That's what Jesus is wanting us to be. She knew something. She had complete access to the judge and to his courtroom. The reason was... Back then, they didn't have a courtroom. 
they met at the city gates. And guess who could go to the city gates? Give me a good guess. Everybody could. Everybody could, and no one could stop them. It was a city gate. This widow knew something. I can go to his courtroom. I can go to that city gate every single day. And she also knew something about old ladies. Old ladies could get away with stuff that no man, didn't matter how young they were, how strong they were, how rich they were, how powerful they were, how good looking they were. And some of you are saying, well, that sounds a lot like my husband. But no man could do it like an old lady. An old lady could go up to any person and chew them out. If a man did that to an important person, they'd get killed. They might get beat up. They might get mugged. They might get killed. But as they viewed old ladies, especially widows, as, eh, they're an old lady. It was shameful to respond to an old lady. I read about a person who just recently they're talking about in Lebanon, where one of the Palestinian or Arab terrorist groups was at, and they took over this part of the city. They said the men were afraid, who objected to it, were afraid to any way let anyone know they objected to those Arab terrorists being there. But he said, every day there was an old lady that would come out there and get right in front of them and stick their, her finger at them and chew them out and say, get out of here. And the terrorists, who would have beat up a man or killed him, would just kind of shrug their shoulders and look at each other and smile. They didn't know what to do. And that's what this lady did day after day when he's trying to act really important at the city gates, while he's trying to be there and show everyone, it'll blow away, but that's okay. I know what my notes are. She just kept it up. She just kept up, I'm on doing it, and she ended up prevailing. Now, here's the main point of the sermon, which it's down there right now. Well, here's what it's not. This is what it's not. And some people believe this is what it is. And they pray this way. It is not that our God is not noticing what's going on in your life. And therefore you need to nag him every day and kind of shake your fist at him to remind him. That's not the point of this message. The point of this message is that he doesn't really care. That's not the point of the message. Go ahead to turn your outlines over, okay? Say, okay. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Of course, you'll find out if you hang around me long enough, I got about 100 favorite verses in the Bible. <laughs> but this is one of them. This is Israel during this time when this was written. They were in idolatry. They were rebelling against God. And they're having all sorts of trouble, but God is exposing his heart right here. And he gives this word to Isaiah the prophet. Would you repeat? Let's, let's stand right now, okay? Stand. Unless for some reason you can't. We're going to read God's word together, okay? Say, okay. It is written, and you repeat after me. It is written. Isaiah 30, 18. And let's put a little bit more oomph in it for this next part. Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Now you say it. And turn to a person beside you. Put your hand in front of your mouth so you don't get COVID. <laughs> say it again. Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Can anyone guess what longs means? It means he longs to. He desires to. He, want, he really, really, really wants to be gracious to you. And we'll continue on with it as written. And therefore he waits on high. 
we're going to do a pause right now. Here's the pause. This word can mean two things. He's up there waiting for us to call on him. He's waiting for us to pray. That verse also means, that word also means to wait, means to rise up. He is even rising up in anticipation of us calling upon him so he can answer our prayers. Isn't that good? Amen? It is written again, For the Lord is a God of justice. That means he wants to make things right. How blessed are all those who long for him. Well, we can be seated right here. Now, we, we have that verse in the very beginning that I should have pointed out, and I, I didn't. It says right there, so you, it says, this is Paul. Well, we'll read it right now. It's, I have the same verse uh, in its context, but I'm going to read this. There's different kind of prayers. That's what the last verse says right here. There's different kind of prayers. And this prayer where we pray and don't give up, it has to do with prayers where we're facing, in a sense, an unjust judge, and that is not God. That instead is it, our enemy, Satan. It says right here, Ephesians 6, 10 to 18, and be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Our struggle, our battle, our war is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. But it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes... You may be able to stand your ground. He's talking about standing your ground against the enemy. There's all sorts of prayers. There's some prayers where you're requesting things. There's some prayers where you're just thanking God and you're worshiping Him. There are some prayers where you're praying in the Spirit. But there's some prayers that you're praying and the enemy's involved. And in those prayers, when the enemy's involved... It says right here, with this in mind, be alert, always keep on praying. And that's what this woman did. She prevailed. Now, getting back to verse 5, verse 4, it says, For while he was unwilling, while this judge was unwilling, I mean, he had taken a bribe. He had taken a bribe in this case, and he was not going to give the woman justice. He had already been paid the money. But afterward, he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, this woman, this widow, who was old, who had no resources, but she was smart, she knows I can come into his courtroom, which is the city gates, every day, and I can nag him, and he can't stop me. He can't stop me. It began to bother him. I, I have right here the, the Hebrew word, excuse me, the Greek word. It means to strike a beating. And it, 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 it resulted in weariness, laborious, and toil. Every time she was doing that, her words were just hitting him. Hitting him. A little old lady was hitting him. Over and over. Every day he got up and knew she was going to be in that city gates. Every day he knew she was going to be pointing her finger at him in front of everyone. You're a thief. You're a con. You take bribes. That's all you do. She says, you need to give me justice. Every day she's going to, the whole time he's trying to act really important, she was going to be doing that. And he says, she's wearing me out. Wearing me out, that's a word there means to strike under the eye. Hence, to beat the face black and blue. That's what she was doing. That's what he said was happening to him. It is, I don't know about you, I like the idea that our prayers bother the enemy. I like the idea that our prayers hit him in the face. I like the fact that our prayers can flat out wear him out. Don't you? I like that idea. 
Like with the unjust judge, our persistent prayers bother him, they wear him out. And notice down in verse 8, so he says he's going to give up. Now he's saying in verse 7, basically, don't, don't mistake that somehow this is talking about me. I'm anxious and ready to do this for you. He said, I tell you that what he will bring about justice for them quickly, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Jesus says, the prayer that doesn't give up, the prayer that keeps on claiming what God's Word says, the prayer that takes a stand against the enemy when you see the enemy wreaking havoc in your family or some situation, the person that every day stands there, not shaking your fist at God, but knowing that God backs them up. He longs to do this. He said, that's faith. That is faith. I have some notes here. You can read about it. I have a Luke 11, 9. It's scriptural. Jesus, when he was saying, ask, you'll receive. In, in the Greek, it's keep, ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. I have that note there. But prayer is often... A spiritual labor or work that's got to be completed. It says in James, go, go down to letter D under point six, okay? Say, so make me feel happy, okay? Okay. It says right here, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And then he says, I'm going to give you an example of an effective prayer of a righteous man that accomplishes much. He says, it's Elijah who don't think he is real special or something, he's just like you and me. His nature was just like ours. He prayed earnestly. We already saw what effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Other translations say the earnest prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. He prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain. It didn't rain for three years, six months. He prayed again and the sky poured rain and the earth produced fruit. Now, here's, here's, I'm going to question you again, because you know the Bible. How many times did Elijah pray for it to rain? Does anyone remember? Seven times. Once for the fire to come down, seven times for it to rain. First time he prayed, told his servant, go look that away. What do you see? He says, I don't see nothing. He prayed again. He said, go look again. What do you see? He said, I don't see nothing. The seventh time he said, what do you see? He says, I see a little cloud about the size of a man's fist. How many remember that now? He says, okay, you guys better get out of here because it's going to rain like crazy. Sometimes prayer, and not when we're asking God for something, but sometimes prayer, when the enemy's involved to one degree or another, there's a work that's got to be accomplished. Seven is the number for a complete work. Nine is the number for a complete provision. There's nine fruit of the Spirit, nine gifts of the Spirit. And that's where this very first thing I had uh, as a, that my first title was Prevailing Power of Persistent Prayer. And are you proud of me for having so many P's in that title? Are you proud? Okay, uh, uh, good, honey, I'm, I, I feel good now. They're, they're proud of me. Uh, uh, but my subtitle was Digging Holes, Setting Poles, and Stringing Line. By the way, back to number seven, how many times did God had Israel march around Jericho? How many days? How many times the seventh day? Seven. You have in Daniel chapter 10 where God had given him a vision, but they... The interpretation, what it meant, was being held back. It happened to be a, a demonic prince. And it says that Daniel fasted and prayed. Do you remember how long he fasted and prayed? 21 days, which is three times seven. Seven is a complete work. Now, getting back to digging holes, setting poles, and stringing line, my son, who works for Grant, Grant County PUD, he's a chief operator down there at Wampum Dam, before that, he was a lineman. And one time he was putting in new lines in the Black Hills of South Dakota. So here's where all the power is, the power plant. Here's where the city is that needs the power, or the farm's at that needs the power. Every day, 
they would dig some holes. Every day, they would set some poles. And every day, guess what they'd do? String some line. But the light still didn't come on over here. But every day, they were digging some holes. Every day, they were setting some poles. And every day, they are stringing some line. Some more days passed. Still didn't have electricity here. But one day, as they kept on digging holes, setting poles, stringing line, digging holes, setting poles, stringing line, digging holes, setting poles, stringing line, the day arrived when that last pole hole was dug, the last pole was set, the last line was strung, and guess what happened? The lights came on. And sometimes that's the way it is with our prayers. Prayer, when we're praying, there's a work happening, a spiritual work happening. And we don't know how far it is from here to here, but every day we're praying. I'm going to give you two stories. I have them right here. The first is my back. I didn't realize it when I was born. No one pointed at me and said, you're standing crooked. I had a leg longer than the other. I didn't know I did. It wasn't much longer than the other. It was only about a half inch. But I ran track. I ran long distance in high school. And what I do remember is the, the longer I ran, my back would get kind of tight. But I had real good endurance and I had good speed. But it'd get tight. I didn't know why. what was happening since my pelvis was like this. I was bending my spine like this. And it was gradually pinching that nerve. I didn't know my back, my leg was shorter than the other, and I didn't know I had back problems. I just knew sometimes felt tight. Then one day I got married, and uh, I wanted to prove to my wife that what a man she married. Some guys would have lifted weights and show her how buff they were. I knew I didn't have a chance for that. So I was going to show her how I could dunk a basketball. All in favor, that'd be quite impressive, especially if I could do it right now. But I went up to dunk the basketball, and I took off my left leg, and it pulled in my back. Finally, my back had had enough from it being bent that whole time. And my back was out. Found out later on that I had a leg longer than the other. I won't go into that story, but the short version of it is God lengthened my leg. But my back still hurt because the doctor told me, he said, you've done permanent damage to your nerves back there and to your muscles. So it's better now. I didn't tell him how my leg lengthened. Um, but he says, you've got, you got permanent damage there. And so I'd pray for it. I'd pray for it to be healed. I prayed about seven to nine years for my back to be healed. All in favor, that's a long time. Never once did I think God was holding it back. Never once did I shake my fist at him. All I knew, God, you have healing for me. And I don't know why it hasn't happened yet, but you have healing me for me, and I thank you for that. One time, I was in a church service, and we had special guests, and they were evangelists. This was when I was in Oregon. And my back had hurt years. I mean, it, sometimes I couldn't even get off the floor. I just trapped on that floor. I just, one time I went fishing, and I couldn't even go fishing. I laid flat on my back, and the bottom of that boat held my pole in the air. I could care less if I got a fish. I could just hardly wait to get out of that boat. I felt sorry for myself. But we had a church service there, and I, I got in line for prayer. And there's about three people in front of me, and there's some people behind me. And I did not hear an audible voice, but I knew God spoke to me. And he says, what do you want? And I said, I want my back healed. And the Lord spoke to me. And he didn't say, Owest, Davidest, thouest my favoritest, sonest. I will doest what you requestest right now. He didn't do any of that. You know what he said? He said, okay. I didn't know God said okay. <laughs> But he said, okay, and, and now if you'd said, did you feel any different? I didn't feel a lick different. My back hurt. 
But he said, okay. If my, if my wife said, last, yeah, yesterday we, we made uh, baby back ribs. They were good, by the way. And, and, and she said about uh, 45 minutes before we, the ribs were done, she says, do you want baked potatoes? And I says, yeah, that'd be good. And guess what she said? She said, okay. I didn't need to bring it up again. It was done. I had baked back ribs and baked potatoes, and that was good. I'm going to eat some more today when I go home. I got down, I sat in the chair, and they were having worship music going on behind, and I started just worshiping God and praising Him. And my mind got off my back. But I said, Guy, thank you. I thank you that you're, you're going to heal my back. And I'd thanked him before. For seven years, nine years, I thank you. You got healing from my back. But after about 15 minutes, I thought back, and my back doesn't hurt anymore. My back's been healed ever since then. I'm an old man. All in favor say aye. I mean, look at the top of that head. We're talking old man. I work for a construction company. I lift lumber every day. I lift bags of concrete. I lift cement blocks. I, I carry 50-pound boxes of nails, one in each hand, which that's not a huge amount, but it is if you're an old man, if you're carrying 100-pound bags of sand. But God healed my back. Now, I had a friend named Dean. Dean Hunt was an alcoholic. He is my friend. His liver quit. He was yellow. He was in the hospital. And as he is laying in the hospital and he was yellow, and, and he says, Dave, will you pray for me? He says, I'm dying. He, the, he said, the doctor said, if my liver doesn't start working, I'm dead. I went home. And I told Linda, I said, Linda, I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to pray for Dean. And I, I was planning on going for the long haul. I, I was going to do some bothering of the enemy. It said Christ healed all who are oppressed of the devil. He's the one ultimately behind sickness. Acts 10, he healed all who are oppressed of the devil. But I was going to pray until I wore him out. But I said, but I was also calling on God. And I got there, and I remember I kneeled in one of the, the rows there of the, of the church, of the seats. I was the assistant pastor, so I had the key. I could get in there wherever I wanted to. And I said, Lord, I bring Dean before you. In the name of Christ Jesus, he's king over there, everything. Dean, you be healed. Your liver start working now. I heard God say something. Guess what I heard him say? I heard him say, okay. <laughs> One time I dug hole, set pole, strung line. Seven to nine years, I don't know how long it was, the lights went on. This other time, I said one prayer about that long. That's how long it was. And he said, okay. I got up and went home. I kind of felt like I was cheating because I was supposed to go there for the whole night, you know. I was going to press my wife how spiritual I was, and I came home immediately. What's on TV, honey? <laughs> Got any more baked potatoes? <laughs> I went to the hospital the next day, and he had color. It wasn't just yellow. There's still some yellow. But I said, Dean, how you doing? Well, actually, before I said that, I didn't say that. Before I had a chance to say something, he says, Pastor Dave. And I said, what, Dean? He says, my liver started working. And I says, I know. Jesus told me yesterday. <laughs> So we cannot make a formula of this. Christians, we like to make formulas. We can't do that. we got to live by the Spirit. As we live by the Spirit, as we know God's Word and we live by the Spirit, there'll be times that you're setting out to dig some holes, set some poles, and string some line. And the very first hole, the very first pole, the very first line, you know it's done. He tells you it's done. Other times you don't know. I don't think that Elijah knew it was going to be seven prayers. What would have happened if he stopped at six? I don't think Daniel knew it was going to be 21 days. 
What would have happened if he had stopped at 19? There's times when we pray, as we know our God longs to be gracious to us. As Jesus is King of kings, with joy on our face, faith in our heart, all sorts of confidence that we call on God, we come against the enemy, we dig holes, set poles, and guess what we do? We string some line. Sooner or later, the lights come on. Amen? Hey, can we, can we sing that first song? Because that's the only, I know that, and I'm not going to lead it. <laughs> and everyone says, there is a God. <laughs> Thank God he's not going to lead it. But whenever I hear God's word, I want to celebrate. Whenever I hear God's word, I want to worship him. You agree with that? Now, some of you, you've been facing some battles, but God, I want to thank you ahead of time. You've got the answer. And I thank you ahead of time. You gave us prayers that every time we pray, it bothers the enemy and it wears him out. I thank you for that. I thank you for that. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and let's sing this last song. I'm standing. I'll let you decide if you're standing or not. We're going to just jump right into the chorus. My Lighthouse. Here we go. My Lighthouse, my Lighthouse, shining in the darkness. my failures in my failures you won't walk out your great love your great love will lead me through you are the peace you are the peace in my troubled sea whoa oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea my lighthouse my lighthouse my lighthouse shining in the darkness You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. Amen. Thank you. And I'm going to pray just one last prayer. Just a short version, as she jumped right to the chorus, I'm going to just jump right to the chorus of the <laughs> Ephesians verse. Father, I pray for everyone here, that they would know the exceeding greatness of your power towards them who believe. I thank you, it's in according to, it's in proportion to, the exceeding greatness of your power, which you manifested when you raised your son Christ Jesus from the dead, far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, above every name that could be named. I pray you bring that revelation to everyone here, how powerful their prayers are. Satan is terrified of them discovering this, and of how their prayers bother him and wear him out. But bring that revelation. Amen? God bless you. By the next week, we usually are supposed to have communion on the first Sunday of the month. We'll have it next Sunday, and the whole sermon will be wrapped around communion. Communion's powerful. Communion's powerful. It's powerful when we know what we're doing when we're eating that bread. It's powerful when we know what we're doing and what it signifies when we're drinking that cup. We ex I expect there to be some breakthroughs as we come to the Lord in communion. Amen? Amen. Well, God bless you.